Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, a new market podcast made possible by VTEX. This is the Friday show that reviews the most, you blow me away, media news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Why life may never be the same again. And I think that's the new normalcy. So talking about pre-pandemic in that sense is almost not worth the time because it's just not going to look like that anymore. Five-minute TikTok videos. You know, YouTube is search-based still. TikTok is feed-based. Those are two very, very different experiences. So until something structurally changes, there will be plenty of room for both of these platforms. WhatsApp finds under the GDPR. That said, I'm a WhatsApp user and I'm not even sure what data they have about me that they can share that I would be worried about. But I don't know that that's the point. Convenience is king. Drone deliveries get some reps in. And why some countries drive on the left and the worst kinds drive on the right. Oh, shots fired, America. Welcome to today's show. Joining me for today's episode, we have three people. Let's meet them. We start by introducing one of our principal analysts covering retail and e-commerce. It's Susie David Canyon. Hey, everyone. Hello there, Susie. Thanks for joining. We're also joined by one of our directors of forecasting. It's Oscar Orozco. Hi, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Hey, chap. Thanks for being here. And finally, we have Peter Varley, who is one of our senior forecasting analysts. Hey, Marcus. Hey, buddy. So what do we have in store for you today? Well, we start with something light. (laughs) Why life may never be the same again talk about that then we move on to our that's our story of the week we move on to our game of the week where our contestants Susie Peter and Oscar will go head to head to head to try to give us the best takeaways they can from each of the four stories we have for you we then move to working from somewhere our newish segment where we talk about what it's like to now work from somewhere that may or may not be the office and then finally dinner party data we talk about things we've recently learned we start with the story of the week why life may never be the same again So why your life will never be the same again is the title of one recent Economist video. Once you get past the overly sinister title, it goes on to explain a new index that The Economist has created called the Global Normalcy Index. It looks at behavior across 50 countries, 5-0, and tracks how many have changed since the pandemic and how behavior might persist beyond it. The data correspondent who came up with this idea, James Fransham, analysed eight different indicators of behaviour, which can be split into three categories across all of these 50 countries. So he looked at transport as one category, which includes data on flight data, public transport usage, traffic congestion. In the second category is leisure use, which includes data from sports attendance, box office takings, time spent outside the home. And the final category, business activity, includes data on office occupancy and retail footfall. So uh, you take all of that data, those three categories, those eight different topics and uh, across 50 countries, and the index uses 100 to mark normality. So if you get to 100, you're back to normal or normality, according to this. Zero would mean there's no activity at all. And a value over 100 means activity is occurring at greater levels than before the pandemic. For context, the worldwide average is just above 60. So if you think of a chart, 100 is a line across the middle and March 2020, the normalcy index tanks. So you've got a massive downward swing and then it's been kind of crawling back on up towards 100 and uh, around the vaccine, got a boost heading up with the Delta variant, slowed things down a bit. And now the resting heart rate for the worldwide average is just above 60. I say resting is currently there, but it's kind of moving up and down every single day. Folks, your thoughts on this new index as a concept and where some of the numbers fall for the worldwide averages or the US? That's a great question, Marcus. I I like that this is updated September 2nd because it really brings us into the not only COVID news cycle, but also all the new latest variants. And so it's really very timely to see that We're at a 66. People had this euphoria at the beginning of the year with the vaccine rollout and all the stimulus. And now everything is ramping down from a stimulus, the unemployment. You know, there's new concerns about inflation. Now we're hearing about stagflation. Anyways, to keep going, I could. But what I wanted to say was (laughs) that that it's really interesting to see that while Overall, it's only a 66 globally. There are some industries like retail that are popping and they're almost close to pre-pandemic. And I think that's really amazing to see. And it probably shows that with the lockdowns gone and retailers open, consumers are confident to go back to stores. Mm -hmm. Another interesting trend that I saw with the chart was how we see this increase through the summer of 2020 and the winter, the index is kind of, it just 
you know, Peter's up and down. There seems to be a lot of uncertainty up until February, yeah. and then it starts coming up from there. So what I'm uh, wondering is... Are for we the gonna, U.S., this is the U.S. This is for the U.S. specifically. specifically. Yeah. Whether um, we'll see that same exact trend this coming winter, because, I mean, that to me is the biggest question mark when we think of all, all of these activities, whether it's media, or retail, or, or just more of the socializing, right, which would involve the flights and the road traffic. So that's going to be an important thing um, that, you know, we'll have to keep an eye out and it'll mean a lot to to media companies to consumers overall i hope that we don't see that trend and and as we see with this line although it's flattening a bit that we'll continue to see some sort of return up to that hundred uh it also does not surprise me that the u.s is at 77 like you said versus the global at 66 so we're farther ahead of that curve Uh, and, and again i hope for our sake that that remains the case moving forward Yeah, it's a really good observation looking at what happened in those winter months. To zoom in on the US for a second, the US overall normalcy index, to give the history of it, it fell to about 30 back in mid-March 2020. It dragged itself to about 50 before the vaccine rollout. And then in January 2021, climbed to about 77 before the Delta variant pushed it back down to about 75 in recent months. Uh, Susie had mentioned that there is a lot of variation by category as well in terms of these different metrics that were tracked in the US The metric closest to 100 was time not at home. That was at 96, so just below pre-pandemic normal, if you will. Retail footfall was 95, sports attendance 80, flight 75, road traffic 70, public transport 65, office use 60, and movies just below 50. Yeah, and it's interesting to see how some of these things are affected by the Delta variant that you know came about and started to impact a lot of behavior and activity around June of this year. We see a lot of the things such as flights and road traffic and public transportation sort of continue this upward trajectory, this gradual return to normalcy. But looking at things like sport attendance and cinema, they kind of start dropping off fairly significantly again in June. So it looks like, you know, there's There's a pattern with some of these group events or group activities where you're around a lot of people in a confined space. And with the new Delta variant, people want to avoid that. So those things are, you know, trailing off. People are avoiding them. I imagine if you added concerts or something like that, we would see a similar dip this summer as people avoid those sort of activities. And Mm -hmm. interesting seeing these low numbers for the flights and and cinema and sports attendance, as Peter just mentioned, compared to the time not at home, which is almost at 100. That's really interesting uh, to me. Um, I would almost expect the time not at home to be a little bit lower considering that. But, you know, aside from these, you know, again, the the long scale travel, the cinema, the attending these big events, I think a lot of things are, are really returning to complete normalcy. I think... But, you know, we've talked about media specifically and how that relates to this. I think with a lot of media time, so the at home time, what, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, I think what we've seen is an acceleration to the shift to digital media as well. And I think that's the new normalcy. So talking about pre-pandemic in that sense is almost not worth the time because it's just not going to look like that anymore. And I think that's kind of the case with flights and these events where it's going to take a long time for us to get back to those 2019, you know, attendance numbers and and all these other um, sort of numbers numbers that we've, we've, we've expected, come to expect with these specific markets and industries? I mean, if at all, because what is back to normal? That's been one of the questions we've been asking ourselves. And, you know, what are we measuring here? How do we know when we're back to normal? And some, it seems like based on these, these different eight metrics that they have, some metrics just won't return to pre-pandemic levels ever. Office use, public transport use. And because of population growth, the total number of people might push those numbers up, but the share of people doing those things just won't ever reach those exactly. pre-pandemic levels. Exactly. Well, I think those That's- go hand in hand too, right? If people aren't going back to the office, they're more likely not to be on public transportation. Yeah. The yeah, one thing absolutely. I don't necessarily understand or isn't clear to me and how it's defined is the time away from home because I thought that in the summer that would be above the 100, right? People are spending more time away from home outside instead of in confined places and at the park or the beach. So I'm surprised that that's only back to 96. 
Well, I guess that's just they, they're they not going out as much as they went out last summer. Yeah, it speaks to those, you know, whether it's one in five people, one in ten, who just never, ever returned to any sort of you know time, yeah. not at home, that they were more used to back in before the pandemic. So, yeah. But that's why I did mention I was surprised that that's at 95, again, versus the, the 100, which equals, you know, right at pre-pandemic level. It's, it's pretty high. Right. People going outside, as Oscar mentioned, you know, up around the 96 Mark, really close to 100, but flights still down at 75. So people are willing to go outside, maybe just not go do some of those activities that they were used to. Hong Kong is the only country that was above the 100 mark of all the countries covered. Back to normality, the normality mark was 100 there at 102. The closest country to them is Nigeria, 89, and then Denmark, 88. The US was at 74, and then Britain was at 72. Another thing that was noted was by Tom Standage, who is uh, part of the Economist team. He was saying that it seems like for some activities, we've gone back into the past for some things. I mean, the pandemic's accelerated some activities, but for some, we've gone back into the past. He was talking about drive-in. Uh, the number of drive-in movies in the UK went from three to 40, four zero since the pandemic. In the US, there are 321 drive-in cinemas in the country, half as many as there were in 1995, but that 321 has remained stable for the last few years years. Susie, when it comes to click and collect, I was wondering whether we're seeing more of a trend and we'll see more of a trend to people pulling up. Do they like to get out of their cars and go in and, and grab their groceries or whatever from inside the store because they can grab one or two more bits? Or are we more likely to see the, the kind of drive-in model? So I think this probably depends on what part of the country you're looking at. I think in some of the mm -hmm. suburban cities where there are Parking lots, I think you probably see more people going into the store to pick up their items and then see what's around there and maybe buy a couple of impulse things. But in places like New York City, where they do have click and collect at retailers like The Gap, I think people are not parking, going inside, but they're waiting for someone to come to drop it off in their car. Yep. Oscar, you talked about digital media consumption. A visual capitalist put together some data from the Knight Foundation that had asked 2,000 individuals about how their media consumption had evolved through COVID-19. It showed that podcast listening had increased the most, surprisingly, was surprising to me, March 2020 to December 2020. That was up 15 points. Video game usage was up 12. And watching online videos on platforms like YouTube, TikTok, that was up 8%. So podcasts, video games, and then watching online videos. Broadcast TV and radio were both down over 7%. But what habits will stick around they asked, uh, what share of folks intend to continue to consume the same amount of media even after the pandemic? They split it down by generation. Gen Z, most likely to continue watching online videos, YouTube, TikTok, video games, and then online TV streaming films. Millennials, online videos, online TV streaming films, and music streaming. Gen Z, online TV streaming films, broadcast TV and books, and then boomers, different order, but similar activities, broadcast TV, online TV streaming films, and books as well. Yeah, our own internal uh, numbers show similar trends here. And actually with podcasts, it's what saw the most growth in 2020. We, our numbers are, speak mm. more to the whole year. Um, but yes, a mobile video game time up almost 19%. Social media video over close to 20 or over 20%. So we saw very similar trends. But again, I think as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's 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 been this acceleration to shift to digital. And so what we've seen is just stronger declines on the traditional media side. So it's it's more the the radio and broadcast TV and print media. But what we also saw is that a lot of this behavior, especially on the digital front, is super, super sticky. And although we're seeing slight declines this year and so on, um, a lot of this behavior is, is going to stick around for the foreseeable future. On top of that, I would also add that our just total time with media, according to our figures, was up close to 8% in 2020. But the declines after that are, are about 1% declines or even less. We're talking about five to six minutes a day. So when we consider that you know consumers are spending about 13 hours a day with media, these declines are very, very small. Yeah, yeah, surprising to see that. It jumped by, was it close to an hour? In 2020? Close um, to an hour, yes, yes. And then, yeah, it's going to tick down, but nowhere near losing the kind of minutes that it gained. So its resting heart rate will still be above those pre-pandemic levels in terms of total time spent. That 13 hours, we should explain, uh, or over 13 hours, is uh, you can be w on your smartphone watching TV and it counts as an hour each. That's all we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Vtex.
Everyone is talking about digital transformation, but what does it mean in real life? Digital Insider is a new podcast series about the digitization of retail, where business leaders, academics, and thinkers discuss how businesses are transforming and give their perspectives, practical advice, thought process, and lessons learned. Go to digitalinsider.com to learn more or listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Folks, we are back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? part of the show where we read out four stories and have our contestants Susie, Peter and Oscar uh, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story okay answers get one point good answers get two and answers that give you that same feeling as when you get home and slip into those sweatpants they'll get you three each person gets 20 seconds before they hear this whoever has the most points after four rounds wins they also get the last word so uh, we'll start with Oscar So we're talking about five-minute TikTok videos. Insider intelligence analyst Daniel Konstantinovich writes that TikTok is about to start testing five-minute videos, according to Gizmodo. The short video app only just rolled out three-minute videos, uh, extended it to three minutes, uh, some eight weeks ago at the start of July. Oscar, five-minute TikTok videos. What's the point? So this is, to me, just a part in the process of growing up from like a niche emerging social platform to something that is a mainstay in the uh, in the online ecosystem. We've seen the same formula before from the likes of Snapchat, Instagram, and the rest, Facebook, many years ago. You know, what they're trying to do is open up more various avenues for revenue. There's an appetite on the creator side, you know, extending the time of videos makes sense. And of course, on the advertiser side, which is what TikTok most cares about. So this to me, again, is just a part of the process. Susie. So I agree. The only thing I would maybe say a little bit differently is that I think the social platforms all started as specialized platforms and were very differentiated. And as the competition increased, and as Oscar noted, everybody is trying to get into every game. And so now we went from each individual platform doing one thing well to everybody trying to do everything. Whoa, that was loud. Sorry. Spells. That was great. Uh, <laughs> Pizza. Sorry. I don't know why I hit it so hard. Did you hear how I just got an extra point there? <laughs> <laughs> but it was building off your answer, Oscar. And the other thing is like, uh, that was really good. Marcus, not, I thought everybody wears sweatpants now, so I'm not sure about that. Reference. Over time? No, everybody wears a sweatpants, so I don't know why a three equals wearing sweatpants when you get home. It's that feeling when you get, when you, you've been wearing kind of stiffer clothes, like Nobody more Nobody is doing that. <laughs> You're True. constantly in sweatpants. The whole of your life is whole still... whole of my life. Should I show you what I'm wearing Whoa. right now? <laughs> Are you wearing uh, formal slacks? Yep. A dress. I'm wearing a, a dress under my gym clothes. <laughs> 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 well played. Peter, what you got? Yeah, these two said it really well, I think. But TikTok still has a long way to go to compete with YouTube. You know, if they continue down this long, longer video route. But... It makes a lot of sense. I have seen a TikTok video or two, and what I've noticed is that the speed at which some of the people talk seems like it's 2x, which means that ideally they would have more time for their video. So this is just a natural extension of of what had already been on the platform. But yeah, YouTube and TikTok still very different. I'm focusing on the comparison because that's what the article we read talked about because, you know, YouTube is search based still. TikTok is feed based. Those are two very, very different experiences. So until something Mm -hmm. structurally changes, there will be plenty of room for both of these platforms. So I looked at our numbers. YouTube users spent seven more minutes on YouTube, 44 minutes a day, than TikTok users spent on TikTok, 37 minutes a day. However, as I was looking at this, there was a BBC article earlier this week that said, uh, actually, so that data was the US, but this article says app users in the UK and US are spending more time on TikTok than on YouTube, according to some App Annie data. So interesting. Uh, we'll see. Next round, we move to WhatsApp being fined under the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So we'll start with Susie. Facebook-owned WhatsApp was just fined over $260 million, nearly £200 million, for breaching the EU privacy law, the GDPR. Ireland's Data Protection Commission, DPC, announced the decision saying WhatsApp did not properly inform EU citizens on how it handles their personal data. This includes how it shares information with its parent company, Facebook. WhatsApp will appeal the decision. They have three months to bring their communication into compliance. Susie, WhatsApp being fined under the GDPR, what's the point? 
So I think the point is that everybody needs to be careful and worry and to play by the rules. That said, I'm a WhatsApp user and I'm not even sure what data they have about me that they can share that I would be worried about. But I don't know that that's the point. The point is big tech can't always win and they have to be careful. And now Facebook has to give away 1% of its profits to settle this. Peter. So privacy regulations just keep getting stricter. So this is just kind of another warning sign that a lot of companies need to pay attention to. Europe is usually sort of the the model or the leading indicator for what sort of regulations we might see here in the U.S. And Facebook's business model is basically collecting and utilizing consumer data. And we see them continue to run into trouble because of that. Oscar. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues here. Uh, Just another example, a recent test case involving Facebook led to the Court of Justice of the European Union sort of defining the joint controller term more broadly. Essentially, a company that ran a Facebook fan page counted as a joint controller alongside Facebook. What that means is it makes social publishers, website operators, fan page moderators all responsible for user data alongside Facebook. So they're all going to be responsible in some way. So they all have to get their act together because I think more and more fines are are coming. Kim Lyons of The Verge notes that the decision by the DPC, Ireland's Protection uh, Commission, started with a 2018 investigation and is the second largest fine levied under the GDPR regulations. The largest happened this past July when Amazon was fined a record near $900 million for breaching EU privacy laws. Move to our third round and we start with Peter. Convenience is king, apparently. COVID-19 elevated convenience to a new level. And that is how it will stay, notes a recent Nielsen article. It warns that retailers need to remain focused on convenience, even as consumers leave the comfort of their homes. Peter, convenience is king, apparently. What's the point? So to cite a couple of our internal forecasts related to grocery e-commerce, grocery e-commerce sales grew 42% last year, and grocery sales from third parties such as DoorDash and Uber Eats grew 216% last year. So everybody loves ordering food online, at least when there's a global pandemic going on. What will be interesting to see moving forward is whether or not people will still be willing to pay for that convenience because there's definitely an added fee in charge to some of those conveniences. Oscar. Yeah, I, the, my main takeaway was really uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult for brands to target consumers. One of the main things was brand loyalty and how that eroded during the pandemic. So brands now have to double down on these upper funnel campaigns to target these consumers. And it's just tougher because I think it's even become more of a seasonal thing. I think there'll be seasons of the year where consumers will want to shop as a hybrid model, both online and offline. Sometimes they'll want to go in store. Sometimes it'll be strictly online, maybe in the winter. So it's going to be a tough, tough uh, road ahead for brands uh, into 2021 and beyond that. Susie. So for me, I think the biggest takeaway was coming at it from a retailer is convenience is not new and everybody knows it's king. It's been king all along. Consumers want frictionless experiences that are fast and easy. I think that the pandemic, as we all keep saying, accelerated many adoption of behaviors. And this idea around omni-channel for me is kind of passe now. And it's more about the all channel, you know, whether it's social commerce, online, offline, whether it's in an app whether it's on your desktop or on your mobile phone, retailers need to be where the consumer is when they want you to be there. And now the baseline has changed. Susie, that's interesting. I want to touch on that for a second because I would have thought convenience is important, but price is king. And I'm curious to know like, how close to price can convenience get? So I think it's actually not necessarily price, but value, which I know might sound right. like it's a little bit too nuanced, but... No, not at all. Va- like Consumers want to get something that is well-priced and that is good quality, whatever that means to them, right? Everybody has a different barometer on that, that is easy to get and to handle and to manage the experience. So it all kind of just wraps into one. But you're right. I think convenience and value go hand in hand. That's a good answer. I know what you're thinking. No, you don't get an extra point. (laughs) Nice try. Uh, We move on to our fourth round. Drone deliveries getting some reps in. Our final round, we start with Oscar. The drone delivery company Wing, operated by Google's parent company Alphabet, just reached 100,000 deliveries. Over half of those deliveries have been within 
Logan, which is a suburb of Brisbane in Australia. Wings service has been available to a third of Logan's 300,000 residents. Folks can order a small selection of goods using a Wing app, including coffee, groceries, sportswear, etc. Deliveries typically take less than 10 minutes. Wings record for a delivery is 2 minutes and 47 seconds from order to arrival. Oscar, drone delivery is getting some reps in. What's the point? I've spoken about my excitement to over drones on this podcast before. I'm also known by the listeners as someone with some wild ideas sometimes. But yes. what it seems is the, the main impediment at the, the moment Bulls is... Bulls being a good team. That maybe. Maybe that's one for you, Marcus. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it seems to be the main impediment is really finding a place for delivery at the moment. Uh, definitely in more urban settings. But I thought of, you know, picturing Amazon locker locations, something like that. Maybe having kind of a delivery airport something like this that might help. But I, I'm truly, truly super bullish on drones. Um, I think that is serves as a great case study. And um, I expect more and more of this. That 100,000 at the moment is not a big number, but I expect this to grow exponentially. Susie. I was fascinated that the drones actually started in 2010, right? So we go back to like, things have been in existence for a long time. It's just that it, sometimes you need something to move that forward. Amazon promised that in 2013, drones would be part of their big fulfillment kingdom, empire, whatever you want to call it. And what I think is happening today is a mix between sustainability concerns, the last mile and how expensive that is. And so it's, I'm not surprised it's working well in a suburb of a big city where there's not high density. And it's a very select, it sounded like a select group of items that people can choose from. And how is it possible that it gets there in three minutes? It's kind of amazing, but it is yeah. a limited amount of things that you can order from today. It'll be interesting to see. Oh, 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 there's more. No, no, no sorry. I just felt like I needed to <laughs> wrap with it. It'd be interesting to see what happens. It will be. Peter. Yeah, picking up where Susie left off with, you know, saying it'll be interesting to see what happens. I kind of can go both ways on this. I'm excited about it because it's really cool. But how practical is it for scaling and... Delivery airports, Peter. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. So, I, yeah, I haven't even thought about sort of outside of, you know, delivering groceries and <laughs> small items to homes. That's a whole nother conversation probably. But Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Oscar's trying to build a I was trying to process what Oscar was saying. I'm like, what is he even talking about? <laughs> no one knows, Peter. It's, you, you, and, you and everyone else listening has no idea. What he's um, well, I was surprised that it said athleisure was on the list of things that it yeah. delivers, right? It's so weird. It's like such a concoction of things. Yeah. There's more things than I thought there'd be, Susie, actually. You said there wasn't too many. I mean, it's not everything, but I was yeah, kind of impressed with how, much, how many things they were able to deliver, coffee being one of them. Yeah. Sorry, Peter, go on. No, I mean, I don't have too much more to add. I'm just thinking because um, of all the optimism around drones of what some of the drawbacks could be and picturing a lot of suburbs and a lot of areas, you know, where people have yards and they have nice views of the sky, which, you know, some of us in the city don't. Are people going to be okay with drones buzzing around? You suddenly can't hear birds. Like, is that going to be annoying? Are there going to mm. be sort of, you know, municipal and zoning restrictions for these drones? Um, and then also this, just the financial viability and the sustainability. Like everything's nice in a small sample when they don't provide much information. But I think there's a lot of things that we just don't know about right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the weather in Australia is pretty nice. So what's it like when it, the weather's not so great? How easy, <laughs> easy is it to deliver these things? Yeah, Susie, you'd mentioned Amazon. Yeah, that commercial, that promo they did, that concept video eight years ago of that drone dropping off a package in someone's backyard. James Vincent of The Verge was noting that Amazon's drone delivery program is struggled because of their need to land and deliver an item. Wings crafts don't need to. They fly to their location, descend to a height of about seven meters or 23 feet, and then lower their packages down down on a tether, automatically releasing them onto the ground. This is a small sample size, but Wing spokesman Jonathan Bass was noting that over 2 billion people live in cities that have populations of 500,000 or fewer. 
However, Wing says their ambitions are to operate in larger cities as well. Have you guys, I know why Oscar is excited about this. Have you guys seen that commercial? It was probably before the pandemic, way before the pandemic of the grilled cheese that just gets dropped. I think it was not a commercial. It was like a stunt. It was like a branding stunt. I think, yeah, this might have been Someone like, catch it in the yeah, mouth. Yeah, like a brand marketing type. Yeah, I, I saw this. Yeah, I this, this is why you It's been a while. Yeah, yeah, this is why you love it. Yeah. You're just going to we'll get see. your lunch served to you whenever you want <laughs> in three minutes or less. I don't have to leave the house. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you're not going to, you're going to participate in that 96% uh, from the. Yeah, I know. You're not, you're dragging us down, Oscar. Get out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So we've got time for, for the game of the week. This week's winner. There's a drum roll going on. Peter is this week's winner of the game of the week. Congratulations to Peter. He wins. Congrats. He, uh, gets, he gets some airtime right now to tell us anything he wants to tell us. Well, thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Susie and Oscar. It was a great competition. Um, it wasn't Susie, actually, it wasn't I'm that sorry. close at all. It wasn't close. <laughs> that's not true. I don't that's think that's so true. Mean. <laughs> um, Susie, I know you're competitive. Sorry, we'll have to wait one more, one more, a couple more, but it's coming. For people who don't know, because she says this before we hit record, Susie <laughs> really wants to win the competition. Don't tell everybody. <laughs> like, Susie, I think really, it hurts your chances, though. I'm sure you know it does. Yeah, definitely. Try to butter it definitely up the judge. Does. I'm 100% sure it does. does. And I wanted yeah. to plug my little nephew in, but now I guess I won't be able to just indirectly. <laughs> Of course no, you can. Plug, Susie plug. gets 10 seconds of her time. Give go. her my time, Marcus. No, All no, right, I don't want it's your time. It's been transferred. Time. It's been transferred. Oh, thank you. I just want to talk about Roblox because we've been talking about the metaverse. We've been talking about retail and the unknown land. And this weekend, my little nephew who's nine asked me to download Roblox so we can play in the same video game together. And it was very sweet. <sighs> and I can see why everybody's on video games longer than before the pandemic now. Susie's nephew is 34 years old, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's not, he's not, he's not 34 years old. That's adorable. Well, That's really, really sweet. Great. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was hard though. It's really hard. <laughs> Why? It takes practice. It, because it's like you're in a 3D world and you're trying to, it's a lot of hand-eye coordination, actually, some of these video games. I thought I was a sort of gamer because I play a lot of words with friends, but I got nothing on some of these kids. I'm just picturing after about five minutes, he takes the controller back and goes, actually, never mind. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> this is, uh, this is not going you well. are not wrong. I don't even think he lasted five <laughs> minutes. He's like, follow me. And we're on different. You have to be on your own device. So like I'm on my phone. He's on an iPad. And I'm trying to follow him. I can't. I can't figure out up or down. And we're swimming and you're running out of air and you have to go back up. It's like ridiculous. You have to find the cave. You have to look for him. So he's like, give me your thing. And I'm trying to explain to him that if you don't tell me how to do it, I'm never going to be able to do it. So you have to teach me how to do it. Uh, he can't teach you up or down. If up or down is where you got lost, it's very there's confusing. no help. Okay. <laughs> Oscar, no help it's confusing, you. right? Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't there's also like user created games in there and uh yeah it's it's not easy he's being generous it's not that difficult i know i appreciate it i have the best <laughs> colleagues well almost all of them thanks appreciate it Susie. Oh, that's a direct hit all right time now for <laughs> it's time now for another so segment working from somewhere <laughs> Uh, so this is the segment. It's quite new-ish. We talk about what it's like to work from somewhere now that offices are kind of closed, but not really, but kind of. So uh, we've got two for you today. One is about leading at a distance. So how do you supervise teams that are working remotely? Asks The Economist. They cite a new book, Leading at a Distance, by James Citrin and Darlene DeRosa of Spencer Stewart, an executive search firm, that attempts to provide some practical tips for managers dealing with staff whom they do not see face to face, the article notes. So the pair of authors take a more optimistic tone, noting that companies can now hire folks who can work anywhere so businesses can develop more diverse workforces. The book also offers some helpful advice like number one, keep virtual teams small. They say the upper threshold seems to be about 12. Anything more than that and performance can suffer. Number two, you need to regularly make employees feel supported and empathize with how they are coping. Number three, be aware that most people misinterpret email since nuance and tone is lost. Number four, long meetings should include breaks that are enforced. And number five, all other meetings should be 20 minutes instead of 30 or 50 instead of an hour to allow for mental breaks in between. Folks, thoughts on this article and other tips for remote leadership, whether the way someone's been leading you or if you're leading people, how you think it has helped? I think one that we can all sort of agree with and we've all experienced is the value in having a small virtual group 
because when it gets above, I forget what their sort of threshold was, um, but when it gets, yeah, when it gets above that, it's just impossible for everyone to get a word in and it becomes cluttered. And I think 12 is even high. If you want to sort of foster yeah. discussion, probably best to be at, you know, four or five or six people because it's not like in real life where you can have side conversations. It's one person talking at one moment in time, and that's really challenging. One thing that I thought was, you know, bit, kind of an odd thing was when they mentioned that meetings should be 20 or 50 minutes long because no one can finish a meeting in 30 minutes or an hour as it is. So to suggest that a 20-minute or 50-minute meeting is a solution just seemed a little silly, you know, maybe in some circumstances that works for people or executives who literally have eight hours of meetings back to back to back. But for most people, I think that that's not really a practical solution. I'd like to ask uh, you guys whether you think meetings are more efficient now when we're all still working from home and it's all, you know, either through Zoom or Google Meet or if they were previously when we would meet in person. Any thoughts on that? It's a good question, mate. I mean, going off what Peter said, I actually tried, I think I read an article a couple of months ago at the start of the summer, which basically said similar thing. You should only make your meetings 25 minutes. Stop making them 30 because that's what the default option is on the calendar. So I tried to do it. It's really, really hard. And I went over, I think, pretty much every time. But I scheduled them to be 25 minutes. I think because of that, you have to just fit less into the meeting and make sure you have a clear agenda of what you want to get done. It doesn't have to be all business. You can catch up with people. And I think that's part of it as well. When you go into a meeting, maybe you haven't seen someone in a while, you want to also say hi and see their face because you're not running into them in the office. So I think if you take a little bit of time to think about what you want to communicate to people, what you want to achieve in the meeting, then they can be more efficient maybe than the in-person meetings. Because I remember those, those in-person ones, you would be getting like chased out by another group of people who were trying to use the same room that you'd kind of overrun on. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the only thing I would add is uh, individually, one-on-one, just have more and more touch points and, and meet with the person like you would, you know, in office, those more casual interactions that obviously cannot happen by pure chance, right? Where you meet someone at the cafe about for a second or two and talk about a project or personal things. But when it's a group thing is, uh, and what we're trying to do more on the forecasting team is have some more team building activities. So I think we should all strive to do something like that. I think it's it's great for just, you know, total morale and, and it leads yeah. to more interaction afterward. I don't hate that at all. I like that, I like that idea. We did a quick catch up uh, talking about the uh, NBA draft and uh, free agency. And it was a nice little 45 minutes to an hour where people got together and talked about something that we want to talk about every time we get on meetings, but shouldn't really be talking about because we're supposed to be doing work. So allocating that free time just for that conversation was, was nice, recreating that kind of in-office experience. I think the company where I used to work, we tried to do 50 is the new 60 for meetings because you also like I think on video you go from one to one so you don't actually really need the five minute break typically speaking but when you're going from room to room you might need the time but until everybody holds hands and agrees to doing shorter meetings it really doesn't work yeah and I don't know that there is a difference really from a virtual versus an in-person meeting as long as everybody has an agenda I think Meetings that don't have agendas are a little bit more complicated unless you agree that it's supposed to be free flowing and just idea sharing and brainstorming. Yep. The second article we had for you for this segment was an article by Iman Ghosh at Visual Capitalist, which explores four ways to energize a post-pandemic workforce. Number one, uh, remember that physical safety remains employees' number one priority. Number two, mental health support is likely to persist. Number three, time and flexibility are becoming more precious than high pay, emerging as a new currency, time and flexibility. And number four, employees want to feel included and hurt. What did you guys make of these four ways to energize a, a, a post, it says post-pandemic, a during pandemic workforce? Uh, and what would energize you guys? So I found the time over pay part a little bit funny because it goes back to that whole idea of does money buy more happiness? And now there's this new study where in fact it does actually, the more money you have, the happier you might be. And so if you're already feeling underpaid or like your pay is not fair, I don't know if you would equate one extra week off with more satisfaction. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I I thought that was an interesting uh, part as well. You know, time in some ways is our most important currency, and so I, I do understand. For example, I tie that back to the, to commuting and not having to commute frees up so much more time uh, in many ways. So I could see that, but to take it as far as you know, people willing to you know take a twenty percent pay cut for a little extra time, I'm not sure it would get to that level. But I do think of these four things you mentioned, Marcus, just considering everyone's time and the allotting them more of it in whatever way they can, I think is the most, you know, kind of important part here. Yeah. So two things for me, mental health support likely to persist one of these points. Uh, they said that eight out of this series, the kind of disconnect between uh, the people who are setting some of these policies and people who are the uh, subject of some of them. Over eight out of 10 CFOs thought that company had successfully addressed employee wellness versus three out of 10 employees who felt the same. That was PwC May 2020 to 2021 study. And then also the employees want to feel included and heard. There are certain groups who are feeling less a lot less included and heard. This article had highlighted women, 35 to 44, who felt like they had heavier workloads and were less able to ask for support as well. I was just going to add, because I was reviewing the study again, and one of the questions they ask or the way that they present the data is percent of people that would accept smaller salaries if they could work virtually from almost anywhere. So the way that I think about that is if you could, you know, take 10% less salary, but move from New York City to Montana, then you're actually going to be profiting a whole lot more. So maybe some of these people are just being strategic about it and (laughs) trying to um, maximize the amount of money they're getting from their job. Um, Because I agree with what Susie and Oscar were were saying before, where, you know, it's going to take a lot for people to give up their salaries. A couple of extra days of vacation or a week probably isn't going to be enough for most. Yeah. If you... It's one thing to like say I'll take less at my current job. It's another thing to move into another job and not need to take a lot more. But to your point, it's what's your take home pay? If you move into a state that is, you know, a city that is say 20, 30% cheaper to live, but you're taking a 10% decrease in pay, then you're still net, net higher than you were. So it's a good point. Funny thing I'll say on this is there was an article I was reading, I think this was from last week's working from somewhere segments. And in it, it had this point, which I wanted to bring into this week's episode, because it talked about a wellness buddy, basically someone that you can run with, do yoga with, play basketball with, or even, you know, set up a fancy football group chat with. This idea of, you know, there are colleagues who you would normally kind of do some of these things with in real life. And so maybe you can keep that going, whether you do some of this stuff virtually or whether you do that some of that stuff in person safely. There are still things you can do together and it keeps people accountable and keeps you kind of getting to know your colleagues the same way you would if you were in person. All right. So we've got time for for working from somewhere. Uh, if you have any questions at all, we still answer your questions. We had questions answered as a segment, which we got rid of for the time being. But we still answer your questions. Podcast at Get in touch if you have anything you want to ask us. Time now for dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing we've learned this week. Peter goes first because he won the game of the week. Peter, what have you got for us? I just thought I'd bring some attention to vaccine rates globally and how mm. different regions are stacking up. I mean, this is still a very important thing to talk about and something that, you know, as a country and world, there's a lot of progress still to be made. So I thought I'd just bring a couple of facts about that. I was looking at the New York Times COVID tracker and specifically looking at vaccination rates by continent. So the doses administered per 100 people, Europe leads with 101 doses per 100 people. North America trails with 96. And then South America, Asia, Oceania, and Africa in that order. Africa is is well behind the, the rest of the world when it comes to vaccinations. And then looking at doses administered per 100 people, The United States does not crack the top 40 countries globally, which is a little bit alarming and unfortunate. So hopefully we can see, you know, in in Q4 this year, um, we can make a lot of progress on that front. Very good. Yeah, it's so hard to keep up with those numbers. So to to be reminded of where we stand, um, very, very important indeed. Thank you for bringing those. Susie, what you got for us? So before I tell you my stats, Mm. I feel really bad that Peter didn't get to have his own to fame. (laughs) And I feel like we should do a redo or he should take my slot now and do his 
What do you want to talk about? Peter, how, how many of those have you done? Don't, don't worry, Susie. Yeah, no, that's okay, <laughs> Susie. I have, I have nothing to offer. <laughs> I'll be totally honest. <laughs> it normally just catches people off guard and they're incredibly reluctant to do it. So you probably did them a favor. I was going to, okay, I'll just say that um, oh. check out Jensen Brooksby, who had a good match against Novak Djokovic in the U.S. Open last night. So mm. America has a future in tennis. The 20-year-old did a, did a really great job. That's my mini plug. And thank you, Susie, for giving me that time. <laughs> Thank you for giving me your time. I feel bad still. And now everyone's going to think I'm ultra competitive and trying to. <laughs> they should do. That's the truth. <laughs> if the shoe fits. You know. Oh, man. <laughs> it usually doesn't take this short amount of time for everybody to realize. <laughs> I got to work on that. It happened quickly. It sure did. So I was going to talk about, given that Biden just came to the tri-state area, rainfall records in New York City, courtesy of Statista. And I am very sad to report that climate change is real and that the they looked at between 1943 and 2021. And the top two were Ida and Henry, the storm, September 1st and August 21st. And Ida, I didn't realize, at its peak, it was 3.15 inches of rain an hour. And then Henry, which came August 21st, was only, only quote unquote, only 1.94 inches. Now, none of this means anything to me, but that's like twice, well, a little bit under twice as big. So no wonder Ida caused a ton of chaos. And then mm. in the eight that I could see, in their chart, seven of them were in the September August time frame. So that's I think when we have to be most careful. Wow. Oh, gosh. These are some very uh, real maybe numbers, that was folks. lackluster data. I don't no, know. No, 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 no it's good. not. It's <laughs> this is just a heavier segment than I was ready for. <laughs> We started with uh, ways in which we will never be the same again. We're ending with uh, we don't have as many vaccinations as we should do maybe at this point. And the world's also doesn't really matter because the world's it's falling apart. The world's, I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> nobody, nobody knows. And obviously you're not going to say that part. But like you all looked at me like. Wah, wah, wah. Oh, that, <laughs> was, that was I love that. I'm all that was on, real. It got real page. really quickly. All right, Oscar, bring us to life. <laughs> Let's do it. So Marcus, I appreciate you leaving me for last year. Best I, of best. course, am on the program this week, and I'm sure it was a strategic decision on your part because of football season. Of the season kicked off yesterday. We're so excited. I can't wait. I'm ready for Sunday for a full-fledged day of football watching and it'll be an intense five months until we have the Super Bowl which will be on February 13th uh, in 2022 so I did want to you know give some love to, to football uh, and give a couple stats to just talk about how big and important it is and to, of course to encourage the listeners to tune in on Sunday if you didn't yesterday so a couple of things according to Nielsen last year they were about 15.4 million viewers either live or on the same day of the broadcast for each game 15.4 million viewers they were close to 92 million people who watched last year's super bowl think about wow. it 92 million there's a three what is it 330 million americans humongous crazy crazy numbers uh in terms of media Kantar estimates that marketers shelled out 5.4 billion in measured media across all nfl programming last year including the super bowl and finally gallup found this was a few years ago but that american football is 37% of U.S. adults' favorite sports to watch. Second is basketball at 11, which pales in comparison. So, wow. so exciting. Everyone tune in on Sunday. Let's get this kicked off. I'm ready to go. What so was for hockey? Those very low, Susie. I think didn't minus register. something Sorry. percent, maybe. Susie's <laughs> our resident Canadian. So. It, was, it was a negative four. <laughs> so, uh, but, Oscar, are people still excited, even though you know it's a foregone conclusion that the Buccaneers will repeat as back-to-back -back champions? Foregone conclusion? What are you wow. doing? Um, the Buccaneers might not <laughs> even make the playoffs, Peter. <laughs> might not even make the playoffs. We All start right. with, the, with the crazy predictions, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, those are some, some good stuff. Uh, Oscar, so if people don't know, Oscar is in, like quite a lot of us at the company, but Oscar's in a particularly interactive and engaging uh, fantasy football league oh, yeah. with his friends. It's hysterical. 
this fa- I'm amazing. desperate for them to you did you start a podcast we we did last year Marcus we did it still, um, it, what about this year is we're it, are hoping we, to continue with I that will produce yes. that for I will quit this job and produce that for you <laughs> full time because it's the they do all these challenges to decide who gets to draft first there's like a was it seven or eight page weekly report yes there's just seven trash talking stats, each other there's yeah there's, there's important so guys and important companies who don't do their work <laughs> and then just focus on fantasy football all year so oh, it's no, brilliant for five months of the year so yeah it's please crazy. bring that back i need that in my life we'll chat about it on a future all right podcast, good i'm sure i'll hand in my notes as soon as I finish. um all right i've got two quick ones for you uh the first is why americans and brits drive on different sides of the road so bear with me on this one it's a kind of short history so bbc america notes that originally almost everyone traveled on the left hand side since swordsmen on horseback preferred to keep their right arms and swords closer to their opponents notes Claire Gillespie of Reader's Digest. Some people are left-handed, but most are right. Also, mounting and dismounting was easier from the left side of the horse and safer done by the side of the road than in the center. So why did people stop traveling on the left? In the late 1700s, when large wagons pulled several pairs of horses were used to transport farm products in France and the US, with no driver's seat inside the wagon, the driver sat on the rear left horse of the pairs of horses that were pulling it, using their right arm to use the whip to keep the horses moving. Since they were sat on the left, they wanted other wagons to pass on their left because you can kind of gauge it better, thus keeping to the right side. In 1773, the British government introduces the General Highways Act, which encouraged driving on the left. This was later made law thanks to the Highway Act of 1835. Meanwhile, post-revolutionary France, under the left-handed ruler Napoleon, embraced a more permanent move to right side of the road. Then, Henry Ford unveiled the Model T in 1908. The driver's seat was on the left, so cars had to drive on the right-hand side of the road to allow front and back passengers to exit the car onto the curb. According to Nat Geo, this influenced a change in many countries. Canada, Italy and Spain changed to right-hand side driving in 1920s, and most of the Eastern European countries followed suit in the 30s. As recently as 1967, Swedish drivers began driving on the right at precisely 5 a.m. on September 3rd, following a radio countdown. That must have been <laughs> chaos. <laughs> so that's why some drive on the left side, some drive on the that's right. Th- Two thirds drive on the right, around, and about a third of the world's population, Ireland, Japan, Caribbean, the UK, drive on the left. So British Empire versus non-British Empire, essentially. Pretty much, Pretty yeah. Much. No, that, that's yep. super fascinating, by the way. Mm. I yeah. love this stuff. Second one I got for you real quick. Susie, this is uh, one uh, from from your region of the world. So the Netherlands gifts 2,000 tulips to Canada every year. Did you know this? I did not know this. Do you know what? It's amazing. Do I know when? You want the date that they're delivered? Oh, okay. So the reason is the Netherlands uh, send flowers to Canada because the royal Dutch family fled to Canada during World War II and Princess Juliana was pregnant at the time with soon to be princess margaret the thing is if margaret wasn't born on dutch soil she couldn't be considered dutch royalty so the canadian government literally declared the ottawa hospital to extraterritorially be considered dutch land so they basically said this this canadian hospital is on now on dutch land for the time being when world war ii was over and the family returned to the netherlands princess juliana was forever grateful for canada's hospitality turning part of their country into the netherlands so um she could still be royalty when she was born and they sent a hundred thousand tulips to thank them a tradition that is still carried out today but with fewer flowers twenty thousand not hundred thousand that makes me so happy that's so sweet. It's like the nicest thing ever. That's, There's so that's many flowers. Canada. Oh, Canada. Yeah, that's, that's a very Canada oh, thing to do. Wonderful people up north. I know. It just gives me that's goosebumps, so you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that is all we've got time for, unfortunately, for this episode. Uh, thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Susie. Oh, thanks for having me. It was so much fun. Why, <laughs> Sorry. why did that take so long? To... <laughs> I, d- I thought I talked enough. I didn't realize. <laughs> I still had quick, one just more. A quick goodbye. Yeah, just one more good- <laughs> goodbye. That's the- is that how you say goodbye to people? You just finish talking and it's walk away? It's an Irish goodbye. That <laughs> <laughs> was indeed. I know. It's supposed to be Canadian. Um, <laughs> just talks about how polite Canadians are. You just walked off without even... Uh- I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. Thank you so much to Oscar. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Of course, mate. Thank you, Peter. Winner of the game of the week. Oh, sorry. Peter, I thought we were just what all is sticking happening? with the Canadian guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank See you, Marcus. Unbelievable. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Uh, thanks to Victoria, who edits the show. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask questions or just say hi, podcast.emarketer.com is where you can find us. We'll see you guys hopefully on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e podcast made possible by 
Vitex. Happy weekends. Mm-hmm.